and you start to question your own reality. But you're you're not going to notice or see that pattern unless you report it. So we know we don't want to like blow things out of proportion, but you, we also have to kind of keep a track record of people's behaviors. Of course, there's physical abuse and that's going to include, you know, punching, kicking, hitting, using objects, um, threatening with weapons, using weapons. Um, that's all of your physical abuse. And then you have emotional and mental abuse. So emotional and mental abuse um, can be the name calling, the degrading, um, the gaslighting. Physical side of it, yeah, you can see things, right? See the bruises, you can see the cuts, and you can see those kind of physical effects on a person. That being said, when you have this psychological and emotional, and I'm going to call it warfare, because that's exactly what it is, um, you know, it's, it, it's another stage of bullying, manipulation, and control. We have an innate ability to sense energy from people and the kind of energy that they're giving off, and maybe something's just not right. Often, we as security professionals overlook the impact that home life has on the workplace. So, you know, uh, the other day on the message thread, we had uh, a guest that kind of uh, had a scheduling conflict at the last minute. So we're like, what topic should we do? And the topic of why don't we talk about workplace violence came in. And I said, that's a good idea. I have a friend, SMB, I think I'm pointing to her. At one point, I'll be pointing to her, depending on where my camera is on the video. And... Uh, Often, we as security professionals overlook the impact that home life has on the workplace. We tell people, hey, you should bring your authentic self to work, but leave your problems at home. But there is a problem that cannot be left at home that accompanies uh, a victim of this problem everywhere they go. It's domestic violence. It often shows up in the office in different ways. Actually, uh, a bunch of years ago when I used to evacuate victims of domestic violence from their relationships and put them in safe locations, one of the key things I had to do was meet with their employer to get them reassigned to a new site, a new shift, change up this routine because it was guaranteed that the abuser would show up trying to find them. We would actually help the employer understand how to de-escalate, know she's not working here, and figure that whole thing out. And so I thought of SMB, like talk to us about how DV impacts the workplace. Awesome. Well, first I'll let everyone know that my name is Sarah Marie Baumgartner. It's that long. <laughs> so long. It's that long. Um, it's so long. <laughs> I had other names I could have hyphenated, but I, I decided against that. So, um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm here today. Thanks, Tim and Pelham and Lee for inviting me. And I am here because I am, um, I've been a nurse for 15 years. Um, I have a passion for safety and security training, self-defense, active shooter training, situational awareness, really bringing that training to the medical community. And part of what really drives that passion, um, started at a very young age. I've probably already always been security minded, even as a young child. But um, part of what drives that is that I'm also a survivor. And I was in a 14 year um, abusive relationship, um, everything but physical abuse. And we can break that down if you guys want. But um, yeah, and so that has really kind of that fueled my my passion and my need for wanting to train self defense, which I did actually eventually end up needing to use with my abuser. Um, but also just understanding the, the implication and the risks that do occur um, at work. And so I have all kinds of like stats in here too. Like I can give you guys, I got all the numbers. I'm prepared, even though you said not to be. <laughs> Man, you're like, you're like the Paul Penn from Three Guys in a Ball showing up with stats and stuff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Sarah Marie, what if we start off 
by highlighting different forms of domestic violence. Because as you yourself just mentioned, there are types and sometimes people might have a particular type in mind. Um, what, what could we be talking about? Sure. And that's, that's a great question and a great place to start. Cause for me, because I didn't experience physical abuse, um, and all the screenings that I was actually doing in the hospital, I was only asking questions based off of physical abuse. And I didn't realize that I was actually in an abusive relationship because believe it or not, we didn't receive a lot of education as a healthcare provider on the different types of abuse that there are. So of course there's physical abuse and that's gonna include, you know, punching, kicking, hitting, using objects, um, threatening with weapons, using weapons. Um, that's all of your physical abuse. And then you have emotional and mental abuse. So emotional and mental abuse um, can be the name calling, the degrading, um, the gaslighting. So a lot of times, um, and I'll clarify gaslighting is kind of, um, it's a tactic, a manipulation tactic to really make the victim feel like they're going crazy. So you may bring something up to the abuser, call them out on something and they flat like deny it ever happened. And they rewrite the script and rewrite the story. And they're so good at it that you start to think, well, maybe it didn't really happen that way. And you start to question your own reality <clears throat> and your own truths. And so that's what emotional and psychological abuse can really do is it, it messes with your mind and it messes with your perception of reality and what's going on around you. Um, there's sexual abuse. So rape can happen in, in a marriage. It doesn't have to be outside of marriage there. Um, so that can happen. There's um, sexual coercion. So just pressuring to, um, to have intimate relations, make the victim feel guilty, um, that sort of thing, experiencing that. Um, financial abuse. So, and this is where financial abuse can also tie into our, the workplace violence and what we're talking about. Um, a lot of times victims don't have control of the money, all of their money, even if they work, their paycheck has to go to the abuser. And so the abuser really um, controls all of the money. Um, there's also other cases that are vice versa, where maybe it's the victim that works and the abuser doesn't work at all. They're at home, um, you know, not working, they can't hold down a job. So we can get into that too on not only do you see a victims at work, but you may also see abusers at work as well. Um, and so I think I covered them all. <laughs> so we have physical, emotional, and psychological, financial, and sexual abuse. I think for security professionals, we often only think about the physical abuse because we as protectors want to protect people from physical harm. But the financial and the mental abuse is so important because that's what creates the invisible prison. And it can be an invisible dungeon or it can actually be a luxurious prison based on how compliant the victim is with the abuser's demands, which can lead victims to doing things they wouldn't normally do because they're trying to create a nicer prison for themselves, if that makes sense. Did I explain that okay, SMB? Yes. Yeah, no, you did. Um, yeah, I mean, I my my ex um, was very successful. We lived in a really nice um, golfing community here in Colorado Springs. Um, so yeah, I mean, it can it can it happens in all um, socioeconomical. Uh, demographics does tend to happen more in impoverished demographics. And that's a whole other topic for another day. But um, yeah, and to your point, I mean, just talking about some of the characteristics that you see at work, I don't know if you guys want to dive into that and start talking about that or where you want to take this. I'm at your mercy. <laughs> well, Lee, uh, I think why don't we ask you which direction we'd like to go in? Because that way we've included you. And I know this is a very tricky topic, but you know, what sort of things are we trying to uncover? Because we want to help prevent it at all, but we want to use the platform of protectors in the workspace. So Lee, I don't know, have you got any thoughts where we could go to add value uh, to the community? 
Well, uh, first of all, I've got to keep my emotions in check. Um, Tim knows that I've also been a, a victim of um, domestic violence myself, and I actually lost my, my career um, through it and, and had to completely rebuild myself, my brand, um, and if you want to put it in a way, click, you know, clean my name. Um, that being said, I think it's a topic that we should really shine a light on um and you know sarah marie you know i have all admiration um and respect for you um and also you know coming on our show today um and bringing your immense value um and understanding of such a a tense uh and tough topic you know because it's it's extremely challenging um for us especially us that are in the security industry and as, as uh, us as protectors of it's kind of the silent silent violence that gets missed side of it yeah you can see things right see the bruises you can see the cuts and you can see those kind of physical effects on a person that being said when you have this psychological and emotional and i'm going to call it warfare because that's exactly what it is um you know it's it, it's another stage of bullying manipulation and control and i think that we really need to tackle this and break it down as much as possible as we can to give the full fundamental value to our audience so that they can identify when there are people that are showing up at work that are being challenged by things that are going on at home and there could be someone that is let's say the instigator of this violence too in your workplace. And then how do you diffuse or identify those potential triggers? Because again, if you think about us in the industry of protection and how we you know, mitigate, prevent these potential risks, we need to know what to look for. So I would really like to explore, you know, obviously, understanding the domestic violence side of it but also understanding how that can exacerbate into workplace violence and then looking at again you know tips you know that we could give to the audience so that, that so again it's all usable um but also because we are known as the human side i also want to dig deep into emotions and feelings too because again we talk about vulnerability. Tim, you know, brushed upon authenticity earlier, yet we're trying to embrace and empower showing up at work, yet you can't bring problems in. Whereas we, and again, I'm going to mention the kindness games, you know, we're always asking people to blend, you know, nice hoodie, by the way, Mr. Wenzel, um, blend it all together. Yeah, bring, you know, for me, Bring your authentic self every single day, because then I know who you are, what you are, and how to identify and how we can work together. So um, I hope that gives you um, some running points, Felon. Yeah, I, I, I previously made some notes and that's helped uh, to clarify because whilst many of these sessions are indeed very entertaining, this one above other ones, I feel we need some instruction, some advice um you know afterwards so sarah marie perhaps why don't we work back backwards um you mentioned the rvr well you don't mention rvr case but you know you know and it can be anything from um rape in marriage to emotional abuse to gaslighting and uh, gaslighting became quite an overused word um during the last few years um so people probably need to separate it from that and you know tim you mentioned bring your authentic self to work but also some problems um that you can why don't we start off with the end game um so marie where where would we like to be in terms of workplace identification what does that look like uh, what mechanisms are there and then we can work backwards into uh how to even avoid it and and then the peripheral stuff, such as workplace collateral damage and, and, and so on. Sure. So, the, I mean, the end game is um, obviously, you know, we would like to do away with domestic violence altogether. We don't want it to be um, 
be a thing. So education, so really educating your staff. And so I know this is a a security show, but you know, security and HR, you guys are going to work hand in hand. And so the staff kind of become your eyes and ears as security. Um, And so working with your HR, going to them saying, Hey, let's, uh, let's implement some domestic violence training for the staff. Let's look at what our workplace violence policies are. Let's create this culture where it's okay for our employees. If they're experiencing domestic violence to come to us and let us know. Um, So early identification is really going to be the key, but in order to identify it early, we really have to create this safe environment because what happens with victims and domestic violence is there is a ton of shame, right? We all know that domestic violence shouldn't be a thing. We all know I shouldn't be in that relationship. Like that's a bad relationship. That's not a healthy relationship for us, but there's this stigma and there's this shame around it. Um, You know, the question, well, why didn't you just leave? You know, there's this feeling that something's wrong with me. Um, I'm so stupid. I can't believe I even got in this relationship in the first, in the first place. But the nature of the relationship is that it tends to be a very slow development. Most abusive relationships, it's not like date one where it's abusive. There, there tends to be red flags, but it's, it's a process over time. And getting out of it is a process as well. And so as security and as a workplace, understanding that your role is being a part of that process of helping that employee come out of that that relationship. Um, so it's creating that, that environment to know that, yes, w- like Tim said, while we say bring your authentic st- self, but leave your problems at home, it's understanding that some problems will follow people to the workplace and having that empathy, that compassion, not being judgmental, and really just understanding uh, domestic violence relationships in the first place. So I think the end game is really just educating and really help putting in those policies and procedures, um, and that understanding to really help, uh, employees feel comfortable to report. I mean, to, to throw out some numbers there, one out of every four women, one out of every seven men. Um, I just pulled up a study this morning, 2010, um, nurses, so for me, for nursing, um, a, a survey was sent out 25% of those nurses reported that they had experienced, uh, physical or sexual abuse in their intimate relationships. Um, 22.8 reported that they experienced emotional abuse. So that's a really high number. Um, that was done, um, by a group of nurses out of John Hopkins university. So this was a, this is a big university. It's a big study. Um, So that's a significant number of nurses that are experiencing intimate partner violence um, throughout their lifetime. So it was a lifetime question, not necessarily, are you experiencing it right now? So it's just understanding that this is a big problem. Um, Eight million paid work days are lost every year. 21 to 60% of people lose their jobs because of, um, so that are in (laughs) domestic violence relationships, 21 to 60% of people actually lose their jobs. Um, And here in the US, and these are all US stats um, too, by the way, um, it's $8.3 billion in costs every year to manage what happens with domestic violence. And that's what what it's costing us as a society. And you know, Sarah Murray brings up so many good points, right? Um, Often uh, people who are victims of domestic violence that end up having an incident at the workplace with their abuser fall under the penalty section of the workplace violence program. You brought this to us. And so they actually get punished for being abused. And then maybe they lose their job, which is a further punishment and another way that uh, resources lost. So if they were thinking of leaving, now they can't leave. So there's a couple really good things. One, under your workplace violence umbrella policy, identifying domestic violence and understanding that victims don't have control often 
over what happens to them at the workplace. So it's important that a, a safe space is created that they can report and talk about, I'm in a not great relationship. I'm afraid that if my so-and-so shows up at the office, there may be a disruption, there may be these things, and it's not that person's fault. They should be empowered to let their managers and security know. Second of all, we forget how great health insurance plans can be. A lot of health insurance plans, they have um, emergency action plans in them, right? You can get counseling. Uh, employers should think about getting remote counseling, virtual counseling, because these people don't have control of their schedules outside of work a lot of times. And so being able to do virtual counseling at work for a certain amount of time is huge for these types of things. So just some of the things that we can be thinking about to offer support uh, to these uh, people. Yeah, Tim, no, that's, that's a great, great point. Employee assistance plans. So look at your employee assistance plans and see, you know, what's going on. Um, for me, when I became a single mom, I had three kids. It was costing me $530 a week for childcare so that I could work. Um, it was, it, it was ridiculous. <laughs> um, so there's, there's so many, there's so many issues, not just while they're in the relationship, but then also supporting them when they come out of the relationship, because there does tend to be like that loss of income, um, a lot of upheaval in the family. Um, I think, oh gosh, don't quote me on this. I want to say it's like New Hampshire or Connecticut. One of the states over there in New England, they've actually passed laws now that then help protect victims of domestic violence kind of under, I think it's under like the Family Leave um, Act. Um, and so thankfully, like those changes are starting to be made, but those are changes that employees, you know, employers don't have to wait for. They don't have to wait for it, you know, to be law, to be able to put um, these policies in place and really look at helping. And I love the insurance too, Tim, because that's, that's absolutely right. Because insurance, they have case managers, they have social workers, they are really good at being able to connect um, that victim to resources that are in their community. Well, Sarah Mary and perhaps Lee and Tim, um, obviously we've got to increase our awareness of people who are being abused and how to help them. But is there not a, another type of person we need to keep our eye on, which are people who are abusers in the workforce, which is a bit of a tricky one because, especially with security, they may look like an alpha individual and they may... Um, they may look like an excellent uh, employee, um, but you know I'll share. I have encountered a manager who used uh, uh, Gestalt theory, which is part of cognitive behavioral uh, therapy, uh, in reverse, specifically to destabilize um, people, and that got them quite far in their career. So, you know, do we often look? Uh, especially in this field, for employees and praise them for their command of, of, of mental abuse um, without knowing that we're doing it, I guess is what I'm looking for. What do you can think, I, can I, Lee? Can I take that one quickly? I think, I think uh, we've talked about this before, actually, when we talked about um, office environments. And I think you have to be super careful if you are empowering that narcissistic and aggressive um, environment because for me that's where you're empowering you know those individuals and, and a collective group so for me that's that's what you need to be looking at you know narcissists sociopaths you know people who are aggressive and in your face you know that those are those are for me the red flags of individuals that may be the culprits or the instigators of this. I, I know Tim wants to say something. What do you want to say, bro? I always want to say something. So <laughs> I just wanted but, to, I, I could see you like, so it's like, go, go. You know, identifying abusers, really good thing. Uh, and this is why talent management, which is foreign to most security companies or most security organizations is so important to understand who your top performers are, why they're top performers, and how they're enabling the environment around them. Because you can have a toxic top performer, right? I have gone to jobs 
to where like I spent my twenties in Iraq. I come home, I work jobs to where every morning I'm like, okay, what am I walking into today? This is going to be a horrible day, which is insane that Iraq mm -hmm. can be easier than some workplaces here. And when I became a consultant, more than once, I would walk into a company and start consulting. And I saw entire teams that looked to me like the DV victims I have been servicing. They were quiet. They wouldn't make eye contact. They wouldn't answer questions. They would look at the person in the room before they were allowed to speak. And I was like, oh my God, these people have been abused by management. And that is easier to see the employees, the teams that are the victims of abuse. And you can see those pools and say, what do they all have in common and start looking at the management styles that are over them, right? Yeah. And so this is where we get into bullying in the workplace, which also falls under your workplace violence program. Lee, um, Lee or no, Fellum, you said that, you know, people are manipulating people to destabilize environments around them so that they can be the top performer, right? Like if you're not watching your management and you're not seeing that they're a top performer, but they leave broken teams in their wake, that's not healthy. And so we need to get away from, well, I really love the work they do. They're just not a team player. We'll put them in a role where they don't have to play with others and let them perform. But people that are abusive to their teams at work sometimes are also abusive at home. Before we give it to Sarah Marie, let's have a think about this, though, because she came out with some amazing stats earlier. And, and, and me as a business owner, it kind of you sit there and think to yourself, have I set my company up to support incidents of workplace violence? And I think that is a key element which women, not just we, but the you know, society on a whole is missing because it's all great, right? Sarah Marie can have the mic in a minute and start telling us what to identify, right? In, you know, in, in, in these kind of people that are the abusers. But the point I'm trying to say is, if your organization is not set up with checks and balances and how to manage these situations, it's pointless that of you telling me that that person is an abuser because my organization is not set up to support the victims. You know, and, it, and it goes back to where, what we said at the beginning, where you're empowering this nefarious act, these nefarious activities to continue. So I think you have to be careful of, you know, where do you really start here? You know, what is, for me, it's about building blocks, right? And then it's setting out that foundation. And for me, I think you always need to identify the checks and balances that are going to help people out. And then moving forward, like, hey, I'll hand the, the, the mic to Sarah Marie and say, right, you know, what do we need to identify, you know, to, to make sure that this doesn't happen? And then can you tell us what kind of support platforms that we really should have so that, again, we can mitigate this challenge as we move forward? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think it comes out like this is why I'm a big proponent of like doing situational awareness training and safety training and and one just training staff to um, to to start having that awareness and having that awareness of what domestic violence really is because when you start really learning and seeing that stuff, then you can start identifying it and seeing it, you know, in the workplace or or at home, um, you know, this doing, doing domestic violence training for somebody at work may save them from what they're experiencing at home. It may never come to the workplace, but it might help them identify the relationship that they're in. So for me, there's no bad training. Well, okay. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> within reason, but training to understand domestic violence and training to understand um, situational awareness, like you cannot go wrong with that stuff. It's, it's, that's the building blocks, Lee, like you're talking about. That's the foundation, like building on that situational awareness um, and, and understanding domestic violence. And so then going from there, and it is, it's a tricky, it's a tricky slope because there are so many instances where abusers are good at playing the victim as well. And so they come across as the victim and, you know, the victim may actually come across 
as the abuser. And I think that's, that's the hesitation that a lot of people, that's the barrier. You don't want to get it wrong. You don't want to accuse the wrong person. You don't want to, um, cause this upheaval for the wrong person. And this is why I love the situational awareness, because what do we say with situational awareness? Trust your gut right? You, we have an innate ability to sense energy from people and the kind of energy that they're giving off and maybe something's just not right. And then that's where that education helps to clarify that just not right feeling about somebody. And so it's putting those checks and balances in place. You have your HR, you have your security, you have your upper management. So you follow kind of that chain of command so that each person can kind of do their role and take part in what they need to take part in, um, in identifying whether there's a victim or an abuser in your workplace. Um, and Tim, I mean, I think you touched on it a lot. There's, there's those charismatic narcissistic people that like everybody loves. Um, I watched my, my ex pull off, got people fired. I mean, very, very manipulative stuff, getting people fired and then just kind of laughing about it. Like it was, you know, Sunday lunch for him. Um, so I, I saw that kind of activity, um, happen and, 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 and in his work environment, I mean, he was manipulating what was happening in his, in his role and in his job. So it, it, it is a, it is a touchy situation and it is a slippery slope. Um, but again, that's where having that education really plays a part. And then if you have a situation that comes up that like, you're not sure of, you might have to bring in a third party, bring in a consultant, reach out to somebody who maybe has more experience than you do reach out to a detective, like a domestic violence specific detective in a local law enforcement and say, Hey, we think we have this situation going on in our workplace. We want to report it. We want it investigated and, and reach out. Don't be afraid to get outside help to help what's going on inside internally. Another place where security directors can really make great inroads with HR under a workplace violence program is um, a lot of employees that term violent at work, and we've seen this over time, is due to backlash at toxic management, right? So you should work with them to set a threshold. Hey, managers that receive this amount or this type of complaints, security should come in to kind of manage the case and, and offer their perspective and I know HR likes to keep things uh, private and separate, which they should 100% do, but certain types of feedback and complaints or a certain amount or complaints that are happening and happening and happening. And then all of a sudden they stop. A lot of times HR will be like, oh, it got better. No, it probably got way worse. Um, and so this is when security can come in as a partner and say, this manager might be a bully. They might be predisposing their team to a uh, oppressive workplace, um, or they may actually be creating the environment where violence at the workplace could happen. How do we work hand in hand with HR and our other partners to mitigate this risk? And I think that's often overlooked because for some reason, security people don't like to hang out with HR. No, well, yeah. yeah. Um, I have, I have HR ideas, um, but I, I worry, and this is not a question, this is a worry, because I don't think we can answer the question that this worry brings up. I worry that things will get misconstrued. So I worry that our concern for people with Stockholm Syndrome could become a harassment case against us, because we shouldn't be prying, even though it's the right thing to do. Um, I worry that people will not see it our way and say, how can you not take a joke? So I, I can think of a few things in my mind, three things very quickly. Uh, one, uh, in one role, uh, some people, possibly me, I'm not going to say it was me, uh, were forced to stand up and become a uh, goal uh, for a, a golf putting. Um, that was quite a frequent thing. Um, another one, someone decided to do a playful uh, headlock on a few people 
except they were trained in jujitsu and they cut off the blood supply to their brain and made them very lightheaded, but it was a joke. Um, and then I know we talk about uh, what it is, you know, one gender and another gender um, more heavily, uh, but it, it was told to me that I need to breastfeed my employees and lots of breast imagery was uh, definitely put in my face about how much I needed to breastfeed, um, which was amusing because I'm, I'm thick skinned, but if I was a bit more sensitive, I'd probably get, a, get offended. So, so what I'm putting on a, on a plate there is the worry that things will get misconstrued uh, either as too serious or too jokey. Mm. Big one, that one. And I think, uh, I think a way that you could certainly walk around this one or, or navigate it would be like, you know, I, and I love the way that, that Tim was going with it. And I also, I love when I passed the ball to, to Sarah Marie and she ran with it and because that's where I wanted, to, wanted her to go with it. For me, it's about partnerships and collaborations. And, you know, Tim, Tim mentioned it about, and, and Sarah Marie did too, about having that partnership and collaboration with human resources and the employee assistance program, obviously that, that sits within, um, you know, HR. So that is for me of how you can define, and it goes back to those checks and balances, right? And again, the environments that you are trying to foster. If you have a framework or a design of what every workspace should be, you know, and again, the, the community spirit, the camaraderie, et cetera. But then again, like Tim mentioned earlier, is that having that, that threshold, I don't think you'll ever fully mitigate events like you've just spoken about. But I think it's, I think it's a complete impossibility. There's always... Now, because it it kind of it it teeters you know on the edge of horseplay or bullying, right? You know, now light-hearted horseplay, I think, usually always has the space in the work as, as long as you're. But again, you got to be careful with it because then it then goes across to actually that's bullying. Um, and I think in the society that we live today, with all the different generations that we have, um, and we're having everybody together in these workspaces that something I might say, I might deem extremely funny. But then let's say a, a 18 year old female, she might be like, well, no, actually, that's, you know, that's not right. Um, and you shouldn't be saying that. But I think, again, if you are reaching out at the beginning, and you've got these collaborative partnerships, and all units within businesses are working together, then I definitely think that you can foster you know, kind of euphorious uh, environments where you are working together and that everybody knows the rights from wrongs, right? But, you know, it, it's not up to us. It's not them put into us to decide what's right and wrong, right? We're, we're kind of like, hey, look, you know, organization work with us, you know, let's work together and let's decide what is right and wrong. So again, that we don't have these challenges, but again, you'll never ever eliminate, you know, those those situations. I mean, that's my opinion. Well, you know, you brought up uh, a good point, Lee. Um, and, and Felum, you also brought up a good point. What if we misconstrue it? What if we think it's too serious? So here's the thing. If you are in charge of a security organization and the company says you must have a workplace violence program, which almost every company says you have to have one, then you should also be working with legal to retain a workplace violence and violent behavior consultant so that they can look at these cases with you and say, I'm not too worried about it for these reasons, but if, or yes, this meets this criteria, I rate the risk and I suggest this type of course of action. A couple of things, one, it brings an unbiased view to it. Two, a lot of times these people um, are doctors, psychologists. It brings a clinical perspective and it helps the company manage its human resources risk and legal risk with an outside qualified certified opinion. The second thing, especially in the security industry, we just need solid management uh, training. One thing I love about uh, you know, at Facebook, when you become a people manager, you immediately become eligible for six months of management coaching. 
to help you uh, understand your team, to help you understand the job and the goals your team has and how to communicate it and lead your team through it and how to um, get your frustrations out of the workplace and with a coach to help you work through them. Because every manager has frustrations. Every manager has a fear. Every manager has a person that's tough. And having this type of outlet uh, is amazing. That's also something that workplaces could offer managers who are receiving complaints or all managers. Hey, you know what? We're going to give you a coach. And that may help and it may not help. One thing, it's a resource to the manager who's having trouble too. If they haven't improved, it's a step you've taken to help them improve. Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> just to touch on it too, it's, um, it's patterns of behavior, right? So one incident, okay. But when you start seeing patterns of behavior, um, that's where it starts to be concerning. But the only way to see that pattern is to start addressing things like the first time. So I would say, well, um, the guy that knows jujitsu should be trained to not take it so far that he makes somebody lightheaded. Like that's an overstep. Somebody that trains in that knows their limits because they should be training to know their limits. Um, you know, the, the, the breast imagery. Okay. <laughs> um, that, that just seems like somebody that's lacking some creativity in their management. <laughs> And so maybe they need some leadership and management classes on, um, you know, coming up with some different material, but you're, you're not going to notice or see that pattern unless you report it. So we know we don't want to like blow things out of proportion, but you, we also have to kind of keep a track record of people's behaviors in order to see, you know, where those patterns are happening. And that happens in every, you know, threat assessment, um, there's a, there's a wonderful, uh, doctor there actually out of England that has actually mapped the patterns of homicide in domestic violence. Her name is Jane Monckton Smith. Um, I can't remember what, what, uh, university she's out of there in, um, in England, but she has gone over so much research and so many studies that she has pinpointed the patterns that an abuser follows leading up to homicide. So these types of behaviors, they're trackable. Uh, part of the reason I was so successful in court when I got out of my abusive marriage is because I'm very pattern oriented. And I quickly recognized the patterns that my abuser was taking. And I was always kind of one step ahead. And, th and that's just my personality. But most people in security, I mean, that's kind of your guys' personality. <laughs> You're very good at seeing those patterns and understanding that behavior. Um, but we have to kind of track it and document it. Otherwise, we're just going to keep, oh, that was just a joke. Oh, that was just a joke. Oh, that was just, and if we're not, like, how many jokes did this person, you know, make over a year kind of thing? But also, every manager should have a manager. And if they're joking is a problem, be like, hey, you have a terrible sense of humor. Knock it off. Like, you don't joke in the workplace anymore because you're bad at it and you're pissing everybody off. Right? And that's where that whole authentic self thing, we need to really help our employees understand what authenticity we're going for because you can't bring your entire self to work everybody would be fired, right? There's things, there's a way to show up in the professional environment, even as lax and fun as I like to be, there are boundaries. And that's the whole point of creating a workplace is to create a place that has the flexibility and the boundaries to allow for work to be done. Yeah, so, uh, we, I mean, we, we, oh, go ahead. No, let me say on quickly and then I'll hand it back to you and then we'll give it to Phelan. I just want to say this. So you usually find abusers have been abused as kids. Then, yeah, that's usually the root of everything. Yeah, because I I, uh, I sit and I'm an avid watcher of these weird programs on serial killers, right? And when you break down that serial killer and you go all the way to when they were your children, you usually find that they went from foster home to foster home. And, and in every foster home, they were abused. You know? And I'm not saying that because like I know Tim's a foster parent and you know, he's, he's wonderful and there are some amazing foster parents out there, but you usually find that abusers have been abused. So that's always a good starting point. And 
I love where we've been going with this is that the fact of the matter is, as security professionals, we get bundled in to do so much. Workplace violence is not our specialty. Active shooter is not our specialty, right? You've got to reach out to those specialists. The specialists. You've got to create those partnerships. And that's who you've got to bring in. You know? and, and again, we talked about the science of it earlier too. And, and again, the, you know, so us as security president, we've got to address this is not on our wheelhouse, right? It may come under our rules and responsibility. Okay, I accept that. I'm accountable for it, but I need help. You know? So you've got to go out and get that help. You know, we encourage, we empower you to get that help. Bring in the specialists, the people that know, that can identify, that can put the science behind it, like I just said about the usually find an abuser has been abused. Yeah, I, that's where I wanted to go with, you know, that part of the conversation. Powerful. Have we have we lost have we lost the magic? No, she's back. She's back. No, I'm back. <laughs> no, I was just gonna share a, a situation that I got myself into at the workplace where I was actually in the hot seat. Um, and it's, it was kind of funny because it's actually, it was around Halloween time and it was a, a doctor's office that I was working in the time and we were doing um, pumpkin decorating contests. And uh, we got a new manager, a young girl just out of college, um, you know, trying to kind of make her name for herself. And the environment became so toxic. I mean, my I had coworkers coming to me crying and just like I you know I was their listening ear and just worried about losing their job being forced to work overtime I mean it was it was a horrendous horrendous environment and we had this decorating contest and I made this joke about we should take an axe because we all felt like we were going to get fired right we were going to get the axe I made a joke of we you know we should decorate all of our pumpkins with an axe like in it and uh, the manager at the time overheard and thought that I was threatening that we needed to come after her with an ax. So I totally get, I totally get like, there's those one-time instances and I was in the hot seat and her boss came and was like, Sarah Marie, like, I'm so surprised to hear this. And I'm like, you're surprised to hear this because you know what kind of person I am. You know, you know, this is the situation. Everybody in this office feels like they're gonna get fired. That's what the joke, you know, was, was that they felt like they were going to get fired, not any, you know, ill intention towards her, like at all. And that's, and that's why you're surprised, you know, to hear this, that that's what was said, because that's not what was said. But that's so why I, the manager got mad, because that was actually like a little bit of a challenge to their authority and management style. And that's why they were offended and wanted you in the hot seat to manipulate that situation. Yeah. So, and, but, and to that point, it just goes to, you know, that pattern of behavior, right? So if you're tracking that pattern of behavior, her boss was surprised that I would even say anything like that because she knew my pattern of behavior and she knew what kind of person I was. So when we're, when we're tracking that and we're looking at that, that's, that's really going to help us, you know, in the long run. Um, and, and it's not that, and, and that's one of the, that's one of the signs of, you know, having an abuser in your work environment, if they can't take criticism, if they're making a joke and poor taste and you call them out on it and they're getting offended and they're escalating, you may want to like pay attention to that and look at that. But somebody who is like, yeah, you know what, that, that was in poor taste. You're right. And they change their behavior going forward. Um, that's, those are kind of two things that differentiate that between that abusive, you know, behavior and somebody that's not going to be abusive. I like that, uh, counter balance to the argument. And I think many people will be guilty of hiring a manager based on their ability to manipulate because it comes off as ability to manage. But in fact, what you've just done is a situation as you have described. I think I need to put up some slides with details of places people can go to you know, find experts. Um, I think we'll, I'll, put, I'll put slides up for the UK and for the US. And I don't think I'll go beyond that because I... I don't think I'd be qualified to find good places to go beyond that, but I think, I think that's it, something that we can do. 
Yeah. If you want, there's, there's a great resource and it was actually in conjunction with, um, let me just make sure I have the website correct. It was actually in conjunction with the UN. Yeah. So it's called no more.org and it's international. So you can go on there, you can click what country you're in and it will give you resources. As long as they've registered with no more, it'll give you resources. Um, it may not necessarily be like human, hu like human resources, workplace violence type stuff, but you can always reach out to those, to those guys and find out who like in your area does that stuff. And then I do have a couple of um, people in the UK as well that, that I could give you for names. Okay, I think that would be that would be valuable. And, and I think it's important for us to underline too, buddy, that that uh, you know I'm certainly not an expert or a professional in that field. Yeah, you know, I think we need to be careful with here and make sure that when we are sharing this information, is that those are the specialists, and that is where we would like you know encourage you to to go towards. You know, if you do have any more questions, obviously, you know, Sarah, Sarah Marie. You know, has a, a broad understanding of, of, of all of these topics um, and we welcome you to to connect with her but uh, for me most definitely um, I can talk about it but I will always point you in the direction of, of who is the expert and, and who is the specialist in those chosen fields very important and we should mention that at least in one country it seems to be the month for awareness of domestic violence which is why I've gone with this purple ribbon. The purple ribbon might also be representative of so many other causes, but there we are. There's only so many colors in the color wheel. Absolutely. It's true. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get security done and somber, but important and instructive. I think this is, this is the tone for today's episode. Yeah, very powerful. Sarah Marie Baumgartner, thank you for coming on. Thank you.